lovely, lovely, lovely stuff. Hey, this is um, this is a fun way to start uh, the day. This is a, an early interview. This is an early interview for me. Is this early for you? Nine a.m. Yeah. No, it is early. It, yeah. Not early necessarily in terms of you know life, but for an interview, it feels quite early. Yeah. Are yeah. you an early? Are you an early riser normally? Have you been up a while? I'm, I'm not naturally, but when I'm working, I have to get up very early. So I can't. Like I, I mean. A year ago, I could sleep in until like ten, and now I can't. Are you really? Are you really busy with work at the moment? Yeah, so we're busy right now. But it's—I mean, it's—it's—it's it's, it's a lot easier than most jobs. So, like, the earliest I get picked up is maybe six. Um, <sighs> wow, which isn't too bad. But, but then three point you... five once. That was. Oh tough. wow! <laughs> yeah, that's 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 not acceptable, really. I mean, that is that is that's still the night before in my book. That's not even a morning. I wasn't, I only go to bed at one, so. Oh, so wait, so you go to bed at one and sometimes, and you're up, well, so wait, so if you're getting out of the house at six, so you're up at what, five, like an hour, do you have an, I need an hour before I can well, leave. Well, that's what I, I know that I'm sort of an adult now is because I've sort of, I need my routine in the morning. I oh, used yeah. to get up five minutes before my pickup. And now hmm. I'm sort of like an hour to, you know, get ready and sit down and feed my cat and, you yeah. know, have a little routine. Yeah, have at, have at least two coffees. Exactly. I, I I cannot function without them. But you see, I mean, I'm a little bit older than you. <laughs> I say a little bit. I'm going to keep with. I'm going to stick with a little bit. Actually, uh, I'm a little bit older than you. Problem I have now is like, I, is when I wake up at like five, and even if I don't have anything to do, like my brain just kicks in, and I just yeah. lie awake in bed, and I, I I can't do that. I find that you have the weirdest, and not necessarily positive thoughts when you sort of lying in the dark in the small hours of the morning. But they're not positive. They're rarely positive, are they? Mm. No, my, no, ne never. It's like you just like stuff that you're absolutely fine with about four hours later when the daylight has kicked in. In that moment, you're just like massive anxiety, huge anxiety. What's going on? I know. I mean, when I had this, I worked in Italy and we had um, 3.45, I think even 3.15 pickups because it was a period drama. Mm. So, you know, you go in and spend hours on your hair and makeup and costume and stuff. And I just couldn't, like, there were nights where I just didn't sleep. Because you're sort of lying there thinking, I've got to get up at 3.15 to go to work. So, I mean, and then, then that, that, you know, those thoughts develop. You're sort of lying there and the small things that wouldn't phase you at 10 a.m. Suddenly, like, the biggest problems in the world. Yeah. Um, and the advice they give you, because uh, obviously, you know, I've looked into it. I was like, well, something I've got, there's got to be some sort of quick fix for this. But they, they say the best thing to get to sleep when you're awake in the middle of the night <laughs> is to not think about trying to get to sleep, which is a brilliant phrase that makes absolutely no sense at like four in the morning. I know. What else can you do? I was, and you have to distract yourself. But then, you know, it's like, how do you, you for me anyway, I have to be like listening to something, put a podcast on, listen to something. And then I, if it's really good, the, the more interesting, the better because then I have to really be thinking about it in order to get to sleep. That's interesting. Otherwise, I... if you're lying there with all your thoughts, you're like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Yeah. I mean, it's the opposite for me. I've tried that because obviously yeah. that's, that's another thing. But like, I tried, what was it? I tried the audio book of The Hobbit as read by Stephen Fry, which oh, is great. Yeah. But, but I, I, like, I just get into it. Like the opposite oh, of you. And then you're the... like really awake. Yeah. yeah. You're like, this is a great story. They should make a movie out of this. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Um, so where are you now? Are you, are you in London? Yeah, I'm in London. I'm just at home. Oh, cool. So you've been, you've, you've lived in London for quite a while though, haven't you? Yeah, since I was like 12, pretty much. Um, but but you, you grew up, I, I want to talk about this just because um, <laughs> I, I love the part of the world that you grew up in. So you grew up on the West Coast of Scotland. Scotland yeah. You wouldn't know so... from hearing me talk. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever have an accent? Yeah, I did. I did. Um, yeah, I think when I think I just moved at that funny age where I, I, I was reading about it. Apparently, if you move before puberty, mm -hmm. you're more likely to change your accent than after puberty hits. So I went when I was 12 and I was the only person at my school that sounded like they were from Glasgow. <laughs> so you slowly start saying like glass and grass and you know um 
yeah can you I've got a fairly 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 strong accent my brothers still do so it's a bit weird and I, I sound very English can you like can you literally tap back into it at the flick of a switch yeah I'm not gonna. I'm lit, obviously. I'm, I was gonna say the I'm, weird thing is, is, like when I go there, I feel like I, like I went to a wedding recently in Scotland, and we got in a taxi, and my my instinct is to start sort of speaking <laughs> slight accent. And when I obviously I was there for ages when I was doing clique, and I just spoke in Scottish accent the whole time, which is great, and it worked for the character. But then now my association with Scotland is like. God, I foul. Like I start going into like really Glaswegian, and I can't get away with it anymore because I'm not. It's weird. Is it, it? It is weird, but I'm guilty of this. So I'm from Leeds originally, oh, and I, I don't know what, why. I don't. I've never really had an accent. I mean, certain words people go, "Hey, are you from the north?" And I'm like, "Oh, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah." Like toast. I don't really yeah, say yeah. toast. But but when I go back to Leeds, just I dial it up. I, I'm just like I feel like even though I never had it in the first place, I'm now doing a fake northern accent because I'm where I grew up. It's it's a strange thing. Exactly. Just so that you feel sort of like you fit in because you know that you're from there yeah you can't do it in front of people that's why i've realized i'll do it on my own if i'm like in a taxi or you know meeting someone but if i'm with like friends and then i suddenly go into like you know glaswegian yeah. I can't get away with it they're gonna be like what are you doing <laughs> I wonder, I wonder, I wonder what it is. I, Cause I like, I get in taxis, like I'll get in a taxi in London and like, you've got like a, a really like cockney taxi driver like, with a thick London accent and I'll start adopting. I'm like, all right, mate. And I'm like, why, what am I doing? I've never had this accent, but I feel like if I have this accent, we'll have some common ground and, and we'll, we'll get on better. I think we're similar then. Cause I think it's some sort of wanting to, I don't know. I think it's, yeah. Wanting to find common ground or wanting to kind of fit in. For me anyway, like I, I grew up in Glasgow till I was 12. Then I moved here. I've got the most insane name in the world. Mm. Who knows where that's from. So I have to always, when someone asks where are you from, I have to say Norway because my name is like so Scandinavian. Yeah. I'm not really, I mean, I'm not really from Norway. I've always lived here. So then, mm. but then, you know, you're not really from any, well, I don't feel like I'm really from anywhere. So then you kind of dial it up amongst certain people. I was presenting at the um, Scottish Bathers a few years ago and I was telling someone a story about like, you know, growing up and they were like, you're not Scottish. Hmm. I was like, no, I, I am. And then they were like, no, you're not. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm not, am I? <laughs> I was like, who am I? <laughs> what am I doing <laughs> I, was, I thought this was going to be a fun, light awards show and now I'm questioning my entire reality. <laughs> Yeah, it's. Um, <laughs> I wonder if it helps with the acting, though. Um, uh, sort of like having, sort of like, not really, sort of being sure where you're from. I just remember reading an interview with a um, uh, fellow Scott, actually, Robert Carlyle, uh, years ago, and he said one of the reasons he thinks he's he, he he's good at acting. I'm sure he didn't say it quite as bluntly as that, but you know, the reason he uh, he enjoys acting is because he moved schools a lot as a kid. Yeah. And so had to fit in in loads of different places, which I guess is a, a similar thing, this idea of sort of adapting your identity based on your circumstances. Yeah, definitely. I think so. I think that's the main reason why I'm an actor. Just to... being all over the place and parents moving about all the time. And, and it is that feeling of, you know, wanting to belong somewhere, wanting to fit in, and then you become mm. quite good at... It sounds really... I sounds like I'm really fake now that I'm describing it. No, I don't. Yeah, but it's I, sort of like shifting your, I don't know, you're quite displaced and then you're trying to like fit into different things. But I think it's, I, I think it's the opposite of that though, because I think people do attach a lot of weight to their identity. Like I think people are like, you know, you, you meet people who are like, for example, Scotland, you know, the, 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 the adage, you know, I'm a proud Scot or like people sort of from my own town in Leeds, they're, they're all, they're very much like, you know, I'm Leeds, that's where I'm from. And if you never sort of really have that for whatever reason, you don't have the accent, you didn't, you moved around a lot, you never spent much time in one place, you do sort of feel that you want to have that identity. So I don't think it's it's fake as much as it is sort of a desire to like have something that you've never actually had. Yeah, no, that's true. That's very true. Like but me. but the west coast of Scotland, wow, what a place! Um, I don't know what it was like for you growing up there, but to visit, I spent every summer holiday for about a decade at some point along that West Coast. So uh, 
yeah, Obam, uh, yeah. the Isle of Arran, uh, yeah. which is beautiful. That's not far from where That's you grew up, is it? Where I grew up, yeah. Um, where else? Sky, a bit further up north, Sky, Arisaig, Malague, all around there. It's such a, a gorgeous part of the world. Beautiful. Yeah, no, I loved, I loved growing up there. But I am also glad that I sort of got out, not got out, but kind of left when I did, because I think I would have probably just stayed in Scotland. Mm. But I, at the same time, like I loved, I, lo I loved having, doing Cleek and getting to go back there. Cause I kind of left, like my, my fa all of my brothers grew up there and went through secondary school. I was the last one. My parents had to move abroad. So then I moved down to England. And I sort of had this weird, like, nostalgia feeling that I missed out and, um, again, sort of, like, lost my accent and all of this stuff. Um, but then I got to do clique and got to go back and live there as a kind of adult-ish. Mm. Um, yeah, I love it. I loved, I loved living there. And I'm glad I, I'm glad I spent my early years in Scotland. I'm it's... Um it's it, it's it's strange because we I, we had um, uh, an actor, fellow Scott Sam Hewen, on the show, and he sounds like he had a similar story to you, where he moved away from Scotland quite young, and then he went back to, in his case, to film Outlander, and he yeah. said like going back there, he really sort of reconnected with what it meant to be Scottish and had this quite deep emotional connection with the country. Yeah, yeah, and appreciation for it as well. I mean, I always I always loved I. I you sort of don't realize how lucky you are until you leave. And then you think, oh my God, that was such a special place. And then getting to go back at that time when I was maybe like 19 or whatever, go back up there as a kind of adult and get to know Glasgow in a different way, you know? Mm. I just knew it as like an 11 year old getting the train along the Clyde, going into Glasgow, going to like Topshop <laughs> and going down Buchanan Galleries, which is like a shopping center in Glasgow. Um, but yeah, it was quite nice to go back and kind of do see it as my brother sort of saw it as a teenager, you know, and kind of experience it as an adult. It was really cool. Yeah. I love so it. I love so it. when you move when you moved down to London, then what was that? I mean, obviously, partly it sounds like it was because your parents uh, moved abroad. Hmm. But was for you was that because you knew London was the place where you could pursue a career in acting? Had you decided at that point oh, that no. acting? No, 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 no. No, it was just to go to school. I think it was just like an easier place for them, for my mum to be and my dad was living abroad. And it was just, everyone was at a different point in their lives. I, I'm 12 years younger than my eldest brother. So my parents had been parents for a long time and my dad right. had an opportunity abroad. So it was just, you know, an easy place to be based and go to school. And um, But acting definitely didn't come into things until a lot of Oh wow! I, that's interesting because I mean, because you were, you were. I think I'm right in saying you you watched uh, and discussed a lot of films when you were a kid. Like film was quite a, a big part of your life when you were young. Yeah, definitely. But I wasn't really the one on the path to do that. I don't think I've got lots of cousins, and they were really they all lived in Bristol, went to like Bristol Vic, and very arty. And I was a bit more, I, I don't know, I was just a bit, I, I just was a bit like, oh, I'm, that's not for me. You know, that's not what I should be doing. Um, but then I sort of tried, like I tried to go to the National Youth Theatre and do, do a few sneaky things, but it just didn't really work out for me. Hmm. But then I realised that I really wanted to do it because I didn't get into National Youth Theatre and I just started sobbing. I was like, is that like so upset? And then I was like talking to my friends about it and I was like, God, this is a bit weird, like my reaction. I must really want to be in National Youth Theatre. And then it sort of grew from there. I realised that like, oh no, I really want to do this. But it was in that not getting in that I sort of realised like, oh, I must really like this. That's interesting. So like on a, on a subconscious level, like a level you didn't even realise, you were like, this is something I, I had no idea that I wanted as much as clearly I did deep down. Yeah, or maybe I hadn't really allowed myself to like, you know think it too much mm. um I don't know if anyone really wants their kids to be an actor I don't know what's it were you did, you did your parents have any advice I never did said anything but I just I don't think it was like I just I just sort of assumed that they wouldn't want that you know mm. um just because it's such a difficult path to go down 
and so uncertain. Um, so I think I probably kind of hid it, but anyway, it all came out in the end. So <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if it's that simple thing because I think we all have that thing where it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure about this, but the minute you're denied it, you're like, well, now I want that. Now, now I'm not allowed that. That's the thing I want. Yeah, it was so it was bizarre. It was like, oh my god, I must. That must be really important if I'm having this reaction. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so you you have that reaction you're sobbing was it in public I, I were you crying no, in public in my I was just like with some of my friends from school and I was like sitting in my room and my mum was like oh, you got the letter from that theatre thing <laughs> I didn't get it I did get in a few years later can I just okay yeah no of course yeah <laughs> <laughs> what well, what, I what? Sort of like sitting in my room and I was like sorry guys I just got some really bad news <laughs> and I was like really upset and they were like it's okay and then I think it dawned on me that evening like oh God, this must be really important to me because I'm really upset about this so so in those in the, in the few years between not getting in and getting in what changed what do you what, started, was there something I, I became obsessed I started googling google was my best friend I was just like how to become an actress how did Carrie Mulligan become an actress like just literally like Googling that and then finding like fan pages and different, you know, breakdowns of things you can do. And it was funny actually, because the thing that kept coming up was skins. And I was like, oh, I just like need to go to one of these open castings. This was all again in my head, kind of like, as I was trying to go to sleep, Googling all this stuff. And then in the end, the first job I actually got was the people that did skins, their new, mm show clique so it was quite funny but yeah it was just I just wanted to try and figure out how I can make it happen mm. um, yeah so am I right in thinking that you initially got spotted at a wedding you were singing at a wedding and uh, you were spotted by a casting director which on paper at least sounds like that kind of fairy tale story of how someone yeah. is just going about their regular life and then wow well, that's all the stories that I would read would be like, and I was walking through Times Square and I got stabbed. And I was like, God damn it, I need this stab. <laughs> but no, it wasn't that much of a fairy tale. It was a bit more vague. It was, I was singing at a wedding. I then got talking to someone. I don't really remember because I had had a few drinks after my <laughs> And apparently I was sort of just, I do, I, do, sorry, I do vaguely remember, but I was sort of talking to them about how I wanted to be an actor, blah, blah, blah. And they knew that I was from Glasgow originally. And then a few weeks later, I was in Norway and I got this email. I got, no, I got a Facebook message from um, a casting director's assistant. And, I was like, and it was, sorry, there's building works going on outside. Uh, it's all right. And then, yeah, the, the, the Facebook message was like, do you want to audition for this series, Cleek? Um, it's a BBC Three show. And I was like, oh my God, this is so cool, but this could also be spam. How has this happened? I didn't you know, put two and two together. And then I was sort of like showing people, asking for advice. And I, my parents were like, this seems really dodgy. Like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> I was also at drama school at this point. So I'd done a year at drama school, which was such a huge thing for me. Getting into drama school was like exactly where I wanted to be. And then I was a year in and I was, it was like my summer and I was singing at this, these weddings. And then I just thought, okay, look, I'll just do a self tape. I read the script, it was really exciting. I'll do a self tape, which I'd never done. I Googled how to do a self tape. I did a self tape, sent it in. And then literally the next day they were like, oh, do you want to come and meet, you know, our people in London and do some more taping? So at that point I was like, okay, this must be legit. This mm -hmm. seems fine. It was still a bit like, what am I doing? Is this, I don't really know how this, you know, you usually have an agent or someone that you're sort of going through and it was just me on my Facebook page. Yeah. It seems that, I mean, to be contacted through Facebook for an audition, so it sounds on paper that you were absolutely right. And your parents were right to go, Hmm, really? Oh yeah. They were like this, you need to be really careful. You know, anyway, I went and it was fine. It all turned out to be good. Um, so and it turned out that the person I met his brother was directing Cleek, Robbie McKillop. Mm. So his brother, Jamie, was at this wedding. And he said to Robbie, oh, you're looking for this girl. You should meet Sinerva. 
I met her at a wedding. She's Scottish. She's an actress. She's at drama school. So then they reached out to me. I think they were trying to find someone who hadn't done anything before. And um, yeah. So and then I went in and yeah, ended up getting the part a few days later. I mean, it's 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 a fairly I mean, this is your first job and it's a fairly big job to to sort of land um, as your very first job. Because This is Jess Brittain, who obviously, like you said, I mean, she created um, skins. Um, how what how was the audition? Did you walk out going that went well, Sinerva, you knocked that out of the park? Um, I knew that they liked I, I could tell they were interested. Hmm. Um, it was a scare. It was. It was. I was. It was nerve wracking. And then I think, like, and yeah. How did it? And then I ended up sort of meeting with some agents because I kind of could tell that it was maybe going to happen, or that they were very positive. And it was all a bit. And and the casting director Jane said, "I think you need to get an agent because it's just safer that way." Um, and then I could tell in sort of the final. We did a few. We had a few meetings with different execs and people and in one of the final ones, I could tell it was a bit different because they sort of started, the, the executive producer, Brian, started saying kind of, okay, look, you know, you have to, if we're gonna offer you this, you have to commit to it and it has to be, and it was just a bit of a serious conversation. And then I was kind of there like on my summer holidays at this casting. And I think in that moment, I sort of realized that it was probably gonna happen and that I would have to make this really hard decision. And then I went to Hampstead Heath and just sort of like sat there for a few hours, like, what should I do? It all kind of, got... yeah, that was- as in, yeah. When you say, what should you do? As in, you weren't sure whether you should take it or what you should do with yourself because you weren't sure if they were going to give it to you at that point and you were like- oh, I think I, I was you know. so overwhelmed with everything and kind of emotional because I had just started this trauma school that I'd spent you know, just felt like such a huge deal getting in and then to sort of throw it away and then... Um, oh, I see. I didn't so know you what were... I was doing and I didn't know if it was... And I knew that I, you know, there was some nudity and it was just all like, I was just in every scene of this show. Hmm. I had to sign up for two scenes. It was just like a big thing. And I was there like, oh my God, I didn't... A week ago I was on holiday and now I'm here and I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Was it uh, was it Parliament Hill? Are you sitting looking over London? In, yeah, by the Lido. I was sitting under a tree, kind of. I, I keep saying that I was cry. I was crying. I think I don't always cry, but <laughs> <laughs> there's been a few. I'm describing these sort of fundamental moments, you know. Yeah. I was sitting under the tree, like, what should I do? <laughs> but um, anyway, I decided to do it. So it was, um, I'm so glad I did. It was the best thing I could have done. What, what I mean, I, I, I think clearly it was, but was it, what was it like for you as your first job? I mean, was it something of a learning curve? And I don't necessarily mean because of the acting per se, but just the experience of being on a set, being part of a production. No, I, I'm, as you're describing it, I'm getting like, it was so, I remember my parents came and saved me for the first week. I mean, I was in every single scene and it was, you know, five days a week, getting up really early, going to work. And then Friday, the first AD called, okay, that's a wrap for this week. Well done, everyone. And I was like, oh my God, we have to go, we have to go home. Hmm. I went home and my dad was there and I was like, I just don't, I didn't want to go home. I just wanted to stay. I just wanted to stay there. We could have done six day, seven day weeks, you know. And then I just, lo I just absolutely loved it. Every minute of it. I mean, after, you know, 13 weeks, you're exhausted. But I loved it so much. And I learned so much. And the crew was just amazing. It's, it was, it's, it's, sorry, go on. No, no, no. I was just going to say it was kind of like, if you wanted to be a screen actor, it was like drama. For me, it was sort of like my drama school doing clique. I mean, it's it's weird because I, I I I guess you sort of think uh, oh was it were you nervous I think that must be a question that that is asked a lot when it's your very first job uh, are you nervous and I remember so you were about twenty two I think when you got the role I did my first TV show at twenty two the very first thing I did and people were like oh were you nervous and I remember distinctly that I wasn't it was this idea that you know it was exciting and I finally got to show people what I thought at least I could do. 
yeah no exactly but then I I was nervous because I I was nervous about the logistical things you know like the luckily Robbie set me up on a meeting with um Jessica Rain who he had just worked with and she was great and we sat down and had a coffee and she just described like what your days will be like mm. who these people are on set you know and that was so helpful but at the same time I was like oh my god there's so much that I don't know about this and also there's so much riding on this opportunity so I was nervous and I went all in and it was um but it was just like exciting you know once you get past the, the first sort of week or so or the first night before you know the night before is always the worst the night before you start a job and then you start and it's amazing and um, when you say a lot was riding on it do you mean because it was your first role and it could if it hadn't gone well you know that could have been it for a few years yeah and I just felt like I didn't know I don't know I, I didn't know if I was good or I didn't know if it was going to be if I was going to do it justice or, you know, like I wanted to give it everything. Hmm. Um, and it was just, it was exposing. I think that was the other thing, you know, it was exposing in, in various ways, not just because I had to, there was nudity in it, but also because I was in every scene and it was a real emotional journey. Um, and it dealt with some big themes, didn't it? It was, yeah. a, it, it was, a, it was a, a show that, um, that addressed a, a lot in its two yeah. seasons. Yeah. And it felt to me at the time, I, I'm sure this wasn't true, but at the time it felt like everything was kind of riding on this these few months. So I did put a lot of pressure on myself. It took me a while and, to recover from, but. And you saw, I mean, like, again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you haven't really looked back since Cleek because you went uh, straight from Cleek onto uh, Medici, um, which I, I can only imagine was a, a very different experience uh, in terms of, you know, it's a, a Netflix show, it's a bigger production, you're filming away from home yeah. in, um, in Italy, I think it was. Yeah, in Rome. How was that? Was that a, 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 a well, culture shock's not quite the right word, but I guess within the, the, the industry shock? These were like, these first two were like growing up, you know, growing up jobs, like mm. still feel kind of like I think only now have I, you know, the past two jobs, I feel kind of it's like, this is what I do and this is my job. And those were like, oh my God, what's going on? You know, like just in, just figuring out how to kind of function and like live and be in Italy and go to work and get up at three and all of these things. But it was amazing. And I learned a lot, a lot on both of them. And then I went back and did them both again a second time. Mm. And then... It's just an interesting progression because each time you do something, you're more and more. I just learned a lot and I gained a lot of experience from those two jobs, which I'm really glad I did. What was it like uh, filming away from home? Did you get homesick? Because I, I, I guess not having friends and family on the doorstep um, when you're out there, you know, on a set miles from home, working with people who you're meeting for the first time, that must have been quite difficult. Yeah, no, it was. It was. And living in a hotel is not, is not fun. Um, yeah, that was, no, to be honest, being in Italy was really hard, really tough the first year, especially. And I really struggled with like, you know, doing a really intense job. And then in three months it's over and you might never see these people again. Mm. I was, you know, at this point of kind of falling in love with this and, you know, all of these people, you feel like you love them so much and they mean so much to you and then it's over. And then you sort mm. of mourn the loss of all these things and this amazing job. So it is difficult being an actor in that sense. I found it really hard the first couple of years because I couldn't, it was really hard to kind of stabilize those moments of like super intense working all the time. And then you're at home, not doing anything. Yeah. A call from your agent, you know. It's, it, it is quite weird, isn't it? I mean, look, you know, it's, it's, it is a, a profession that, um, that like, you, like you've just said, has moments where you are, it's very intense and then it's calm. And even though you're like, it, like you, you sort of do know another job is going to be coming down the line hopefully. in those moments. Well, you see, yeah, yeah, of course, hopefully, but it's like, you, you do never know. I, 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 I get, I get that, but there, it's like. But it's actually like the first few. So after, doing maybe four or five then you think okay I've had five quite 
big jobs, chances are I'm going to get another one. Mm. But after the first one, you're like, maybe it was a fluke. <laughs> you know, even my parents were like, do you think, do you think you'll get another one? Or do you think it was just, I mean, it was so, it seems so unlikely, you know, things like that. And you're kind of like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I won't. You know, but after doing a few, you can think, okay, listen, like be sensible. You've had four or five. You're going to get the sick. It's going to be fine. Mm. And yet you don't do that, do you? Because the minute, like, it can be a week after you've just finished your last job, and you're like, and you're like, that's it, I'm done. I'm, I've I've screwed up. Why is the phone not rung in the last seventy two hours? Uh, no one likes me, and you can't, you can't sort of. Your brain just doesn't allow you to go. Stop being stupid. You just finished. Like, there's something's going to come along. Yeah, exactly. But but I'm better at that now. But you know, after you know, back then it was like impossible to kind of have that rationality and that's when you that's when you're awake at sort of coming to the end of Medici and you're lying in your hotel room and you're, you've got to get up at three and then you're like oh, what about in six days time where will I be what's going to be happening you know and then you start thinking, oh. yeah I mean, but you, I mean, you've worked with some big, big names on uh, Medici. I mean, look, uh, from my, from my end, I, I love Sean Bean in a costume drama. I'll oh, yeah. never not love Sean Bean in a costume drama. Did you, um, did you get any advice from people, like, in terms of what with it being your second job? I'm not saying people taking you under Yeah, no, the, I was like wing. a baby in it. So mm. people were very helpful. It was nice. They gave me a lot of advice. Um, yeah, definitely. But and so... So how how were you still doing Medici when you first heard about last night in Soho, or were you uh, you had you finished by that point? I was doing what was I was on like the last week of Medici, and then I had to come back for an audition for Last Night in Soho to meet Edgar and Nina Gold was casting it, Um, and and yeah, it was nice actually. I finished in December, and then I think I got offered it in January, so. Um, and we didn't start filming until whenever May, so I had some nice time to prep. I didn't have to wait too long. And Christmas is usually, you know, that Christmas period, you sort of give yourself that. And then January the 7th hits and you're like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So was it, what, was, what did you have to do at the audition? I auditioned for various parts. They just had me reading loads of different parts for it. Um, and the character that I'm... That I ended up getting Jocasta. Mm. I don't know what happened, but I was reading her, and then I was just sort of suddenly found something, and I was kind of clicking, and I knew that it was it was just different to anything I'd ever done, and a bit funnier, and a bit kind of more, um, yeah, just a bit more brash and a bit more kind of. She just doesn't really care. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna come clean. So I haven't seen last night in Soho yet. So I am trusting you to tell me stuff that is spoiler free. Because if okay. because I I just I at this point you know I, I I'm a huge Edgar Wright fan. I, I haven't seen it. So Jocasta, by all accounts, from the little bit of reading I did do while trying to keep my brain clean from anything that might reveal too much, she is something of an antagonist to Annie Taylor Joy's character. To Thomas and Mackenzie's character. Oh, I see. Okay. So Thomas and Eloise, plays Eloise, mm. comes from Cornwall and comes up to London and wants to be a fashion designer. She goes to fashion school. And my character is her main sort of antagonist in present day London and just sort of makes her life a bit of a nightmare, um, which was so fun because I've never, never done anything like that before. You know, I was playing the sort of virginal, like, nun in Medici. And then I was Mm. there on set, like, just channeling all of the sort of mean girls at school in the year above. That was my, that was what I was doing. It was great. (laughs) So is that, is that where you got in, how you got into character? You you remembered the mean girls at school. I I guess there are always mean girls at school. Yeah, or just people that have sort of slightly turned their nose up at you in the most subtle ways. And that you maybe, as a teenage girl anyway, like that happens a lot at school. And it's usually with girls in the year above, um, in my experience anyway, that, you know, mm. you thought were very cool. And then it's just like really subtle ways of, you know, looking down on someone. Although Ducasta's not so subtle. <laughs> um, but you've got to try and make, you know, you've got to try and make someone believe, you know, 
based in somewhat of reality. So <laughs> it was it was really fun. It was really good. Because there, I mean, it's it's you know, it's uh, it is it something of a cliche, but you do hear a lot of actors uh, talk about how playing a villain is just way more fun than playing a, a good person in a film. It's so fun, but then again, it's really difficult because you don't know. My character's a sort of villain, but she's she's I don't know. She's got some really funny moments and funny lines, and there's like a balance between. I don't know. It's it's harder to know when you've got something right in terms of I, I've never really done comedy or anything like that, but it's it's a different it's a different experience working with a director and trying to get a laugh or trying to get something that isn't you know a dramatic sort of poignant moment. It's it's different. Your your character's there for a different reason, so it is kind of it's just a whole. It's a different experience. So it's it's challenging in in that, in those ways, but it was really fun. I did notice that the crew approached me in a different way on that job. To in what in what respect? Because I was, maybe I felt like I had to overcompensate and be super nice to try and make sure people knew that I wasn't Jocasta. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not giving away too many spoilers. I don't think I am. No, you're not. You're not. It's it, it, what you. Everything you've said is is out there, and believe me, you'd see my face drop if you gave away a spoiler. But we're definitely on the right side of the line at the moment so wait so you thought the you, the, the crew were a bit sort of like sheesh this this girl it is my head yeah <laughs> I was like oh my god they're gonna think I'm horrible I need to be so and then I'm sort of walking around like hi hi guys which I am actually to be honest I'm like that anyway but I think I was just in my head I was like because I was walking around and my you know just sort of walking around as Jocasta and then sort of thought do people think that I'm this is me. Oh no, I, I need to make you know try and make up for it. But I hope they all know the real. I'm me. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they were, I, I, you weren't you weren't going full uh, full method then. You broke character between <laughs> scenes. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um, I guess in terms of sort of like learning to do comedy and, and aiming for uh, humor in a performance, you could have no better teacher than Edgar Wright. Like I said, big fan. Um, Ed, were you aware of his work before? The film, because yeah. I, I I sort of worked out like, um, obviously there's a, an age gap. You'd have been about I don't know, just eight years old when Shaun of the Dead came out. Um, did was yeah. were you aware of what a big splash that oh, made? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and Hot Fuzz as well. I remember watching that, being absolutely terrified. Um, but they were huge movies, you know. And and I think I was that age where you're sort of coming into being a teenager and it's kind of on the edge of what you should be watching. Mm. But definitely. And then I saw Baby Driver. Weirdly, it was at this one period when I was like really not doing anything. Um, and then my agency had like a few tickets to the premiere. But they were, you know, it was just like a few. And then I went on my own and it was a bit like, oh, what am I doing here? I don't really know anyone. <laughs> And I remember sort of looking and it was like, oh, the cast was on the stage and he was there. I'd never really seen him in real life. And it was like listening to him. And then I sort of, you know, watched the film and had a really nice time and then went off and back to my normal life. And then whatever, like a year later, I was in a room with him. And it was just very strange. I was like, oh, this is quite cool. that I'm now here in this room with this man. Um, who I've like admired for a very long time. Um, yeah, so I've known, yeah, I've known a lot of, a lot about him, and his work, and always watched, always really liked it. It was, um, and it was quite. I think it was, it was quite a good interview uh, he was doing on stage at the Baby Driver premiere. Uh, oh. I, I'm not going to keep this joke going. I hosted did, that. Did you that was, it? Yeah, that was. Uh, so you were hosting it. Yeah. Edgar was there, Lily James was there, all of the very big cast. Mm. And I was sort of up at the top and they all looked fantastic. And I was all excited because I got this ticket, but I obviously couldn't get a plus one, you know, so I was on my own with <laughs> all these people. But at the very back, watching you, Alex, <laughs> Edgar Wright, I'm thinking, God, I've got a long way to go. 
Uh, well, it turns out it was like you say, it was a year later. You were sitting in a, a room with him. What's it? What was it like actually working with him on, on set during this movie? Because I mean, like, you know, as far as sort of he's just an oracle of, of movie knowledge, that man, as well as a fantastic director. Yeah, it was great when we were doing, we were doing rehearsals for a little while. And we'd sort of, he's just so funny that like we'd be sort of reading something and then he'd get his laptop out and then be like, have you seen this clip from this film? And he'd be like, he was just all, you know, he's such, he's, as you say, like this oracle of movie knowledge. Um, so in that sense, you know, you just learn a lot. And it was, it was really cool reading it as well. There's so much, I know his movies, they always have an amazing sort of soundtrack and, there's so much that goes into the script that isn't just sort of dialogue and writing. There's like, you kind of feel like a whole essence of this movie when you're reading it. Mm. Um, and it's the same kind of working with him. He's always referencing, I'm just gonna close my window. Um, yeah, there's just like a lot of references to, um, to sort of things he's inspired by. And it's that's interesting because you don't often get I don't know, you don't often get that level of like, oh, this was influenced by this, which was influenced by this, which is influenced by this film in like the mm -hmm. 50s and then da 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 da. Um, and that's really cool. That's really exciting and really, yeah, he's like a definite, he's like a holds up cinema in like a really amazing way. Um, it must be like sort of, I, 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 I... I, I know from interviewing him, but I imagine working with him on, on an actual movie, it must be like film school. Like you just must learn so much about like some of the most um, like, like iconic movies and sort of, you know, cinema in general, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, no, you do. Absolutely. And, you know, we come, I, I think he's got this, um, it was so, it was actually a while ago that we shot this now because it keeps being pushed back, the release. We shot it before the pandemic. Um, so in 2019 in the summer, but going on to set, he has all of his sort of shots and breakdowns for the day. So you can kind of go and it's all storyboarded. Um, yeah, and it's, it's, it's really different working with him. He sort of, you do a take and he's like, okay, we've got it. And there's no kind of bravado around like, that was amazing or this is an amazing shot. He's just like, yeah, cool moving on next setup and sometimes you work with people and they're like oh my god that was the best no beautiful and you think oh wow and there was a moment where I was like oh god is, he, is this not but it was actually really exciting and cool because it was like a trust in your own yeah. craft do you know what I mean mm. instead of like having to big yourself up and big up people around you people wanted to work for him and he knew exactly what he wanted and what the result was going to look like um and yeah there's just like a lot you put a lot it's like you can trust him so much with everything and um, i guess that's i guess that's a sort of like a, a, a two-way street really isn't it because you know you, you're in the film and you've gone through the audition process he's seen what you can do so by the point that you're actually on set you know he has complete trust in you that you know what you're doing so he probably doesn't feel the need to then go oh let me let me reinforce you know how good yeah, you are like, because it's trust yeah. No, exactly, which is nice. But again, it takes it takes getting used to if you've been, you know, if you're insecure, if you need that. But but by you know, if there's this lovely sense that everyone's all working together, and we know what the we know what we're working towards, um, which was really really nice and really exciting. Um, there were a few times where I can't remember, I just like remember his laugh. He's got this like very bellowy laugh. <laughs> um, and occasionally, like mid take, if you find something really funny, you just hear like ha 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 ha, <laughs> like from somewhere, somewhere in the studio. And you know, <laughs> oh, okay, it's good. It's funny. Uh, it's, it's uh, what a feature debut for you, though, for your first feature film to be last night in Soho, working with Edgar. Uh, you must be thrilled. Yeah, no, so so thrilled. I was really excited to get that. And, you know, you've done like you've done five years, I think you've sort of been acting um, professionally. Uh, when you look back over your career five years in, what's been one of the best moments so far in terms of what you've done? God, that's a good question. Thanks. Um, I don't know. Best moment so far. 
I mean, they've all been so exciting, but for different reasons. I would say last night in Soho, getting last night in Soho and going to, I think the day after I was offered it, I went to do a, to meet Anya and Thomasin and we did a little mini table reading and that was a working title. And I think that for me was like a really, yeah, really exciting sort of moment and knowing that I, don't, I, I was just, I've always wanted to do films. Like I've always wanted to, I've always loved cinema. So to be cast in a film by a film director that I, you know, love and have always watched mm. was, I think, probably one of the one of the biggest moments. Or maybe sitting under that tree in in Hampstead Heath. Prior. Yeah. <laughs> did you uh, did you need to visit Hampstead Heath after getting last night in Soho? Was that I, I'm going to call them Heath moments? Was that another Heath moment? No, it wasn't another Heath moment. But there's a lot of Soho moments in acting, actually, especially if you're kind of, you know, going to loads of meetings back in the day before COVID and before Zoom. You probably know you go to all these meetings in Soho and then you've got all this adrenaline. You've been getting ready for your recall and then it's over and you're sort of walking around Soho like, oh, what do I do? I do <laughs> Should I have another coffee? You know, so Soho has been another one of those places. And I think for that Edgar Wright, audition in Soho was actually funnily enough the place I was sort of wandering around like what just happened because so did, obviously it's a recreation it's a of a Soho in the the 60s but you weren't actually filming in Soho were you these yeah. things must have been oh you were filming in Soho as well in Soho doing night shoots in Soho closing down like you know I can't even I can't remember what the name of the road was we were filming in in pubs on the street. The whole street was turned into 1960s Soho. It was amazing. Oh, wow. I assume that, that so you'd have to build sets. At five in the morning as well on like a Saturday night. You see some, there's a real underground world that you assume is no longer there, but it's definitely there. Yeah. It's what's great about Soho, isn't it? It must have been really nice to um, to be filming something that celebrated Soho. I mean, it's such an iconic part of London. It, you know, it is being redeveloped, has been redeveloped. It's changed a lot. But I think, you know, you still scratch the surface, like you said, and there is very much the original Soho buried underneath. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that was really cool, filming in Soho. It was amazing. Probably won't happen again. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you don't know. I mean, who knows? But no, yeah. is there a, is there a moment like because obviously, you know, like last night in Soho was quite a big. Uh, well, I, it is. It's a, it's a big film. It's your feature debut. Uh, then, you know, there was the first time you sort of uh, like auditioned for Clique. Is there an aspect of your job that has scared you the most? Like the, the time that you remember genuinely being quite frightened about the prospect of something? I'm always frightened about the prospect. Mm. I'm excited, but before I start, I'm on a job now. Um, the Midwich Cuckoos is what, what I'm filming at the moment. Oh, um, the John Wyndham novel. Yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. David Farr's done an adaptation for, um, for Sky. So I'm filming that. Um, but you know, the night before I was like absolutely terrified and you know, sending the director all these texts and, but I, I, I it's always scary, but it's kind of mixed with, good it, it has to be a bit scary hmm. otherwise there's kind of no cost to doing it but I think the, the scariest was um actually waiting for Cleek to come out that first season because I didn't work before it came out very quickly like we wrapped in December 20 I can't even remember 2016 maybe 2015 and then it was coming out in like the February or something like really quickly and but I hadn't worked that whole time and because it, it was my first job and I, there was some sex and some nudity and it was just, and drugs and, you know, all the above. And I knew that everyone would be watching it that I knew because it was my first sort of professional job. And that, you know, that was terrifying because I didn't know how to, I almost didn't want anyone to watch it and I didn't know how to deal with that. What what aspect like what why was it why was it so terrifying? What aspect of it? Just like because so exposing, like it's right. And what if I was 
terrible. And what if my parents had to watch it and think, oh God, she's awful. Oh, you I know. see. It's sort of that idea of swinging for the fences with like yeah. actual sort of quite sort of extreme stuff coupled with the idea that you didn't know if you'd been good in it. Yeah. Right. And also just seeing myself, like seeing, no one should ever see themselves in 3D. Ever. You know, it's not, an, I mean, they should, but, and I have to, but it's not a natural thing for like a 19 year old to, I don't, I don't really know how to describe it, but it's, it's not a natural thing to see you existing in 3D somewhere as not yourself. It's just a very confusing prospect. It's interesting. So you can you never sort of disassociate from the fact that it's you on screen? Like you, can you watch Cleek or can, are you going to be able to watch Last Night in Soho? And during the moments that you're on screen, can you can you sort of just enjoy it as a film or are you always going to be watching your performance and analysing what you've done? Yeah, so it depends on the distance that I've had from it, I think. And the best thing with Cleek, what happened was I started to watch it on that first day that it came out. Or I went, no, I went to the screening with my dad the first episode and I think one of my parents I can't remember who said this one of my parents was like oh it's it's really brilliant because it's I don't see you when I'm watching it I see Holly and that was amazing because then I suddenly was like oh yeah so do I and then I sort of realized that I am it's not me but there's you know it's confusing at the beginning because it's like you're critiquing yourself but it's actually not you're playing someone else but I can watch things back. Like I just, Cleek just came on Netflix and like people were messaging me about it. And then me and my partner start, sat down to watch them. And I was so proud of my, I was like looking and I was so like, oh my God, this is amazing. But at the time I was sitting there like, oh my God, this is horrible. And I don't know about Last Night in Soho. I like to put watch, I like to put off watching stuff for mm. as long as I can um, and then watch it. And then I can appreciate it because it feels like a long time ago. Um, uh, does again, it change? Does it change with how? I'm guessing Holly had elements that were similar to you, whereas I'm I'm assuming uh, that Jocasta does not. So when the character is more removed from you, as it as with Jocasta, is there is it then easier to just watch it as a performance? Yeah, I don't. Well, I have to get back to you because I'm. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah, haven't worked that out. But I would say the distance, and I just watched a short film recently for something I did ages ago. And at Not the time, v. I sort of, yeah, it was V at the time. Yeah. I was like, oh, I don't know. And I watched it back because I had a meeting with this director who was referencing it and mm. said how much she liked it. And then I thought, oh, watch it. And I was like, oh, that was brilliant. But only because I did it four years ago can I now think, oh, that was great. You know, it takes a bit yeah. of time. Oh, was that four years ago? Yeah, V is really good. It's actually it's um it's on YouTube at the moment. So if anyone wants to see it, it's a really interesting little short film, beautifully shot, and you're great in it. Thank you. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, yeah. See, I did my due diligence yeah, before. Good, good work. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, professional, professional. <laughs> so. We're here in 2021. Um, I mean, you've worked for Netflix, you've worked for the BBC, you've got your first movie coming out. When you look around sort of the landscape of the industry at the moment that you work in, what, what gets you excited about working as a, a, an actor in 2021? I think I don't know what, what's, what could come next. As in, it's not predict like the writing isn't predictable. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like I, when you say that, actually, just to confirm, because I mean, especially in TV, but I guess in film as well, but I think certainly in TV, you know, people are pushing boundaries that they haven't pushed before just because of the qu quantity that TV is making, but also because of the money that is being invested in TV shows now. And the people that are writing it and the people that are doing it, people, new people are being given opportunities and it's exciting because you don't know what sort of what sort of part might come your way or what kind of and if and if you do, if you can predict it then I would say it's not worth doing so that's what you look for so you want some if you were pre presented with a script it's something that you co couldn't have foreseen would land in your lap that actually gets you excited about it yeah or that I couldn't I couldn't necessarily predict what what the story is or what this character is something that's um I don't know I'm so bad at articulating myself, but something that makes you, you have to really invest and 
and look at this character and think, where is this, where is this going? And if you can predict where it's going, I don't mean like a t ha ha moment, mm -hmm. but like if you can, if it's a predictable storyline with a predictable character, then it's not for me worth. I want to be, I don't want to, I don't want it to be predictable. <laughs> yeah, that makes, that, makes, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Absolute sense. So it's like, is there a character that you would love to play? I mean, it, it could be either like, is there is there a, a historical character, a figure from history, someone who's been in the public eye that you, you've always been fascinated with that if that role came along, you'd be like, oh, I, I, that is someone who I would love to get my teeth into metaphorically. I've always said if they ever did an Amy Winehouse biopic, I would want to play Amy Winehouse. I don't know how realistic that is, but, and I'm sure it will happen and I, I probably won't end up playing Amy Winehouse, but that's always been my dream because she's my absolute favorite singer of all time. That but, would be, yeah. yeah you, I, so you, you were a fan from, from back in the back when she was here with us. Yeah, huge fan. So that would be one. That's a that's a good one. And like you say, I'm sure I'm sure it will happen. There'll um, be quite would... a few people in the running for that. Say that again. There'll be quite a few people in the running for that one. I imagine so. I imagine so. But you know, for what it's worth, I would love to see you play Amy Winehouse. I think that would be great. Um, Sinova, uh, that has been uh, our interview. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I've loved it. Thank you oh, so good. much. I'm sorry if I've been. You know when you have really clear thoughts, but then you can't turn them into words. Every single day of my life. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I'm sorry if I've done that. No, you haven't. You haven't at all. But I get I get that all the time. I'm like, I think my brain seems to think my vocabulary is better than it is. And it aims for words. And then it goes, and then you end up going, but what is that word that you don't actually know? No. But you didn't do that. That's just me. Um, thank you again, and, and good luck with the movie. Uh, I cannot wait to see it, and thank you for a, a no-spoilers-based chat. Yeah, thank you so much. Hello, Alex here. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to get in touch with us at all for any reason, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at JTFpod. And don't forget to subscribe to the full audio podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods.